Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to James Cook University, Singapore. My name is Abhishek, Abhishek Bharti. I'm the campus dean, and I'm also the, the, the MC for, for this, this evening. Um, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to the Good Science sequel to Great Business 2018, the Australian Festival of Innovation in Singapore and ASEAN. This evening, we have Professor Maxine Whitaker, who will be delivering the festival lecture optimizing the value of health innovations and effective TK analysis approach. We have dignitaries such as His Excellency Mr. Bruce Cosper, the Australian High Commissioner of Australia to Singapore, and Dr. Dean Anderson, Deputy Vice Chancellor and Head of um, Campus Singapore. And they are here amongst us tonight for the, for the festival lecture. So without any further ado, I would like to invite uh, Mr. Bruce Cosper, the Australian High Commission of Singapore, to deliver his opening remarks, please. Thank you, Dr. Dale Anderson, uh, Dr. Abhishek Bhatia, and of course, uh, Professor Maxine Whitaker, um, who's the Dean of Public Health, Medicine and Veterinary Science from James Cook University. So a number of you have heard me speak a number of times <laughs> already. It's the, it's the problem with having a festival of innovation with more than 40 different events um, and speaking at each one of them. Um, some people have heard the story uh, quite a few times. But the point is that we're trying to showcase the very best of Australian science, connecting with the very impressive ecosystem that Singapore has built here and talking about how we can do better with each other and for each other and indeed in the region. Um, so we've got quite a program um, and already we've had um, seven or eight events. Um, got many more events coming up in the next few weeks and it will culminate with the visit of our, our industry and science minister um, towards the end of the month and many other things. And it's not just people talking about what they're doing, we're, we're announcing quite a few things including the Australian National University um, announcing its opening an office here, CSIRO opening an office and in particular, James Cook University opening the Tropical Futures Institute. So that will be a very significant thing. Um, James Cook has been a very, um, a very generous uh, platinum sponsor of what we're doing and in fact a very important supporter of things that the High Commission does and things that Australia does here in, in uh, Singapore. And uh, I have to say James Cook is a fine ambassador for Australia as a university and, and its contribution to Singapore and the role it plays within the community here, it's quite impressive. The theme that we, we um, really came upon was to talk about the way good science could translate into great business. But in, in reality, as we were reminded uh, a few days ago, there's much more at stake here. It's not just in producing great business and um, the wealth that comes from that, it's about solving problems to make our societies better, healthier, more sustainable in, in all sorts of ways. And there couldn't be a better way of demonstrating that with the topic that Maxine will talk about tonight. So it's really about things that are much deeper and much more important, particularly nowadays, of course, when uh, we're, we're facing such, such challenges, uh, technology, geopolitical, geoeconomic, um, the populist uh, uh, insurrection in, um, in various places, the waywardness of the US president, all those sorts of things. I can say that here. Um, you, you know, we really have to sort of focus again on what's important for our societies and, and the sort of contribution that science can make to that. And so I'm looking forward to hearing uh, a little bit more about that uh, tonight from Maxine, who was also a participant in a very interesting uh, event we had earlier in the week that featured women in innovation. Some Singaporean and Australian women who are, are doing some remarkable things in science and uh, innovation, sharing their experiences. So I'm very much looking forward to hearing more from Maxine tonight. So welcome everybody and I look forward to um, participating in the discussion. Thank you. 
So ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests um, and colleagues uh, who I'm getting to know more here at James Cook University, Singapore. It's my pleasure and honour to be invited here tonight um, and I want to congratulate up front the Australian Festival of Innovation and Science in Singapore. It's a, a wonderful event and I wish I could stay for the whole month but uh, work calls unfortunately so I do have to get back home. What I'm uh, going to do today is, this is a bit of a mind map, um, probably more orderly than my mind usually is, uh, to try to walk through a couple of things. So there's some progress here. I'm going to start with talking about some frameworks that I personally use when I try to look at any change in a health system, uh, any innovation, whether it be a hard innovation or a soft innovation like changing counselling skills, health promotion, etc. So I'll go through quickly those four frameworks for you. Then I'm going to give you a couple of examples of how I've used them in some of the places that Avashek mentioned I'd worked. Um, in Vietnam, around contraceptive technology, around uh, in Papua New Guinea where I lived for nearly 10 years on a new vaccine, Haemophilus influenza B, and then around malaria diagnosis and treatment. Then I'm going to move to a new area to think about, um, around healthy ageing and healthcare and how innovations are being brought into that arena. Um, what's now being called geront technology uh, and many other names as well. And then I'm going to try to pull it all together by using those frameworks to try to think about what might we need to do to optimise the effectiveness of these when they get into real life health systems. So that's, that's the journey I'm going to take you through today. So, what are these frameworks? First, I wanted to start with one that WHO has recently uh, brought out, talking about the need for people-centred and integrated health services. And this week, while I've been here in Singapore, meeting with some colleagues in other universities as well, I've heard that term integrated health services used a lot. I've seen it in Singaporean health documents as well. What it's trying to do, and you'll see when we come to technology why I'm, I'm focusing on this, it's trying to make sure that the person or the client or the patient or the community member, whatever context they're touching the health system about, is at the centre of the care. And that whatever it is we introduce, that we make sure that they actually are the centre of that, that it's not being driven by technology or some researcher's pet project, or something that the health department wants to bring into place. We remember that the people are at the centre of whatever we do in healthcare. So that's why I think it's an important, uh, important place to start uh, as a framework. And particularly when we come near the end of this uh, chat with you this evening, so we start talking about older people healthcare, often it's not only the health sector that's going to be involved. You may also be working with social services, you may be working with transportation, you may be working with ministries of housing. And so trying to remember about how to try to get all of these people to talk together with the person as the centre of those discussions is going to be very important. The next framework, and to some of you here this might be familiar, is the WHO's health system framework. And again, a lot of people criticise trying to just do six building blocks, but it's a good place to start, particularly when you're trying to explain what a health system is. If I start from your right-hand side first, again, it says whatever you do in a health system, you have to remember those, those outcomes. It's not about financing, it's not about technologies, it's not about health workers you have to try to look at, are we going to actually improve health? And to do that at the level of care, but also equitably. And it's a very important part of the Sustainable Development Goals to talk about health equity and universal health care. So that's important. Whatever innovation we do, is it going to give us those outcomes, but not just for a few, but equitably? The second is that the health system is responsive. It's responsive to the people who come to use the service or try to find out why, why people aren't coming for the service and be responsive to them as well. The third is to make sure that the health system 
and this sometimes people don't understand this term easily, has risk protection both socially and financially. So firstly, financially, that when they come to get health care, they're not going to be put into catastrophic financial situations. And a lot of the talk about universal health coverage, particularly universal health financing, is to make sure that if anyone gets sick, that they're not going to be put into the poorhouse because they've had to seek care. The social risk protection is again to make sure that people are not stigmatised, belittled, uh, made feel. When I was in Vietnam doing an anthropology there, I had, uh, I had um, a person I was interviewing say, when I come to the health system, I feel like the sick dog that's left, that's kicked out of the health centre to sleep outside. That's what social protection's about. Not that people feel bad when they go to the health service but because of the way they're treated. And finally, of importance to us and why I focus on optimization is to make sure that it's efficient. We still need an efficient health service. Uh, and we all know that you can't just throw money at health and expect to get outcomes. It must be effective, it must be efficient. So to get that, you need to start thinking about access, coverage, quality, and safety. They're the parts in the middle. And therefore, you need to think about these building blocks of a health system. You need to think about what are the models of service delivery, primary health care, secondary health care, tertiary health care, hospitals, community outreach services. In Bangladesh, we actually had little rickshaw vans taking, uh, setting up satellite clinics out in rural areas. The next is the health workforce, whether that's from people in the community, volunteers, uh, community-based health workers, through general practice services, allied health services, up to maybe doctors and specialists in hospitals. The third is around the information systems. How do you actually collect the information around what services are being offered, both at an individual patient level, but also population level services? How does that get integrated? And I know uh, Singapore, I've been seeing the discussions about electronic health records, some of the same debates that we're having in Australia about that being a tool, but a tool, not the ultimate. Again, we, these are all tools that we talk about when we talk about some of these innovations. The fourth building block is around the medical products. So the vaccines, the syringes, the needles, uh, the x-ray machines, the cardiac machines, the CT scanners, whatever. All of those technologies, uh, drugs and other medical products. And then the one that usually ministries of health and prime ministers and others worry about, uh, the financing. How is this all paid for? Uh, is it a mixture of public-private? Are there insurance systems involved? Does the patient have to pay out of pocket? If they do, how much? Is there some risk protection for people who can't afford to pay as much? Uh, and how do you make sure that there's, particularly in decentralised health services, enough funding available for people wherever they are? Uh, Indonesia is a very decentralised health service uh, and some provinces are very, very poor. And so no matter how much percentage of their uh, gross domestic product of that province, they cannot provide the full package of social services. How is that balanced? So they're the sorts of questions that are asked under financing. Are there donors involved, like the Australian government in many of the countries in which I've worked? And the final building block is the leadership and governance. That's the regulations, the policies, the laws, the medical, uh, the medical liability, all of those sorts of things, as well as who leads the services and how's that done. So they're the building blocks, and we'll come back to that from time to time as I go through some of these innovations. The next is um, a framework I've used. Um, I was involved in its development in the mid-1990s, and we were looking at introduction of new contraceptive technologies, or in some places, taking technologies out because they were either poorly introduced or were no longer of any use in those systems. And so we looked at the science of scaling up, getting some innovation in, but making sure that it's done effectively, efficiently, with access, etc. And again, I'll just walk you through parts of this because again, we'll have a look at this. This was for contraceptive technology, but the important thing is to think about the user, the technology and the service 
and how they interact with each other. The user is at the top and that's making sure you understand the user's perspectives, what their previous experiences have been, what's their health, but also what's their social cultural influences on decisions they make, uh, on whether they can make decisions, and in many settings, the gender influences, because in many settings, women are not empowered to make those decisions themselves. So you have to understand the user when you're trying to think about technologies and all that baggage that they bring with them. Because if you don't, you won't optimise the effectiveness of the whatever you're introducing. The next is to think about the technology. So in family planning, we think about what's the different method mixes? Are there pills? Are they long acting, short acting, permanent, uh, reversible contraceptives? A whole range of things we think about. You need to think about that mix. Uh, you need to think about how efficacious, how effective is it? Is it going to give only 5% protection against unwanted pregnancy or 99% protection? So you need to think about those sorts of things, the side effects and how people might react to those uh, and how the service might be able to support those side effects, how it's administered, can I take it as a pill, do I have to get an injection, do I need somebody to do surgery on me, can I do it at a home or can it be, does it have to be in a hospital, is it reversible or not? and how long does the effect take? So pills obviously daily, an injectable three months, a tubal ligation for life, unless you get it reversed. So you think about the technology and then you think about the services. What are the policies? What's the program structure? A lot of this work we started particularly because some countries in our region uh, had very forceful population policies. Singapore used taxation, etc. I remember I've read a lot about Singapore's population policies and today I saw that they're now saying maybe we should reduce the price of matchmaking ads so that we can reverse, reverse the problem you have about um, population decline. Um, but there were a lot that were being quite aggressive and that was very important when you were thinking about family planning methods. Because if you have a method that a, a woman or a, or a man have no control over, once it's there, they could never get it out. That might be a problem when you've got an aggressive a population policy. So it was an important thing. And that was part of what really drove us to try to think about a model for introduction. And then who are the people? What are the facilities? What's the quality of care? And how accessible is it? So that's, that's one of them. And the last one, which is in the title of my paper, the effectiveness decay analysis. And this comes out of some colleagues of mine in the Swiss Tropical Public Health Institute. Um, I work a lot with them. And basically it's saying, this is a theoretical thing, you might have something that's 98% effective. You know it's really going to work. But it has to get into a health system. And as it goes through the health system, at different parts of the health system, it can lose some of that effectiveness. These are just theoretical numbers, just to illustrate. But if it's only accessible to 60% of the population, you lose that 98% effectiveness, it goes down to 58% just because of an access issue. So you're already not going to achieve what you've paid for if you're the Minister of Health. Then if people, so for malaria diagnostics, you know, is it real, are we really diagnosing malaria or is it something else? If that's not done well, in this theoretical example, it's done well 95% of the time, but you've still got some decay. Then if the provider doesn't follow the right regulations, doesn't choose things properly, doesn't provide it in the correct way, if they're not compliant, then you can lose some effectiveness. And then you get the last person, I suppose, in, in the chain is, is the patient supported to actually adhere to using that medication? They, have they got the questions? Can they seek information, etc.? Were they told how to use it effectively? And can they, in their family environment, use it effectively? Or are they going to keep some of the pills for when, the next when my children get sick, so once I feel better, I'll share them with the other children and it'll save us money? That's a decision that's often made. So again, if you don't have only 70% uh, of the patients adherent, something that the health ministry thought was going to be 98%, a great 
a great buy for the health system, ends up only being maybe 37% effective. So that's what we mean by effectiveness decay. So I've taken a little time to walk you through this because I'm going to now pretty quickly flash these up for some of the examples I'm going to use. So first I'll start with family planning. So the innovation we're trying to do in, um, this was, uh, in Vietnam, we had two major innovation arms. One was we wanted to reintroduce Depo Provera, an injectable contraceptive, because there was very little choice in the Vietnamese program. There was a strong reliance on sterilization and on intrauterine devices, but a lot of younger women, newly married women, women who haven't yet thought, or husbands, that they were going to finish their family size, they wanted something in between. And so they wanted Depo Provera, but it had been introduced very badly in the past, had a very bad name. The second thing was to try to improve the quality of family planning services in that setting. So let me just see where we are. No. And so there were issues in the family planning program in Vietnam around the information that was or wasn't provided to, to women and to men and to couples. They didn't have choice, as I mentioned. Um, a lot of the, tech, uh, the providers weren't very technically competent in even the services that they were meant to provide. The provider-client relationship was very poor. I told you the example of feeling like a dog kicked out of a, a sick dog kicked out. There was often no follow-up provided for people. They got the method and then they were forgotten. And they might come for family planning, but nothing else was provided. And some of you, without me going into the details, can imagine that a woman who comes for family planning might also have some other health problems linked to reproduction that she might want to talk about. But they weren't. The women were siloed. So we had to try to address some of those issues. So two parts to the innovation. So if you can remember the triangle, so now we're testing. You had some dinner before you came. Up the top was the user. What did we need to know about the user? So we used a lot of qualitative research methods to understand what their experiences were, what they felt about the system, what their experience had been with other methods, tried to understand um, from an epidemiology point of view what was their health profile, and so got a picture about what was happening. So we, we knew quite a lot about Depo Provera, and we needed to try to think about how we were going to improve the system for that, but also not just for Depo Provera. Because of all of these other problems, we had to improve a lot of things for every method that was already in the program. And then finally, we had to look at the service. Because when we were introducing Depo Provera, we had to think about technical competence of the providers, how all the supplies were going to get there, how it was going to be funded. So now, if you can remember the building blocks, yes? So if you think about the building blocks, service delivery, what was the model of how we were going to deliver, there we go, thank you, how we were going to deliver this family planning method? And it was decided that this would be at the clinic level, but the follow-up could be at the home. And so that was the service delivery models. But how did that fit with the other services that were already provided? And none of these are unique blocks. They all come, they all, into, you know, sort of, it's a complex system. They all have, have effects on each other. Because if we're going to do it at the home, then who's going to provide that service? Have they got time with all the other work that they do? We had to think about the health workforce. They needed to be trained. We needed to train trainers for them. We needed to give them practice aids. And we really had to focus on that quality of care, particularly how they talk to people and provided information to people. We needed to think about the information system because this isn't something that you give a packet and people can go and get it somewhere else later. Every three months they were going to have to come back to get another injection. The information system wasn't designed to have those reminders built into the system. So we had to think about the information system and then how that linked to the supplies. And then finally, how do we get all those supplies there? Because there was the injection, there was a syringe, there were needles, there were alcohol wipes. Uh, because there are some side effects that need to be addressed, how do we get the side effects things also available? Um, and some of those came from different departments of the Ministry of Health and the National Council for Family Population and Family Planning. So how do we get all of that to come so when a client comes to get a service, 
everything's there at the right time. So that's how they all integrated. How did that get financed? Again, we've got two ministries. Who's going to pay for what? And how do they pay? We make sure it's all happening at the same time. And then how do you get those ministries, the leadership of those ministries, and the Vietnam Women's Union, who was a major player in family planning in Vietnam, how do we get them to work together and agree to these policies and all support it so that you actually have leadership in supplying the services? So if you just walk down the ladder, again, I didn't change the numbers. The numbers were theoretical. But we knew that family planning, depot provera is 97 to 99% effective. But if you go down, if we didn't have access to that method, then you're going to lose the effectiveness. Not all those people. And the access had to be for different age groups. Because often a lot of the younger women weren't coming because there hadn't been a choice for them. So we had to think about that. Diagnostics aren't a part of this, but helping people make the right choice for their lifestyles could be a diagnostic, if you like, and wasn't something that was being done very well. Provided compliance was something that was going to be very important to make sure they provided it properly. So you could have lost a lot of effectiveness if, it was, if all those things weren't thought about. So we had a multidisciplinary team of researchers, the ministry, the Vietnam Women's Union, all from the beginning designing this program, working together, learning together, and then it scaled up. And it actually became the national guidelines for quality of care and for adding Depo Provera into the Vietnamese family planning program. So, another part of the world, Papua New Guinea. Uh, and here, what the innovation was, was to try to introduce Haemophilus influenza B vaccination. Uh, Papua New Guinea had major problems with Haemophilus influenza uh, pneumonia and meningitis and was already getting drug resistant Haemophilus influenza. So we needed something because we were having high mortality rates. It's a very difficult country to get around. I don't know if any others of you in the room have been to Papua New Guinea, but there's limited roads, no trains, um, and lots of very big mountains and 700 different distinct languages. So access and getting information across, major challenges whatever you do, including in the health system. But we also needed to improve coverage. And right now, uh, Papua New Guinea is having a polio outbreak. Uh, not wild polio, vaccine polio, vaccine linked polio, but it's now gotten into the capital city uh, as of early this week. So coverage of vaccination programs isn't that good either. So can we, while introducing something, improve something else? And that's what this model gets you to think about. But what were the other vaccines there? Did we, could we actually add this vaccine into the other packages? It had a different schedule. That would have meant that babies were coming at one month, two months, three months, four months, five months, six months. How many of you in the audience would want your children or grandchildren every month to get a jab in the arm? and you having to deal with the crying and upset afterwards. Um, so that was something we had to look at. Could we actually fit it into the schedules without losing some of the effectiveness? What were the side effects? And it needs a cold chain. It needs to be kept at a certain temperature. So how do we make sure that that's there? So they were the things we had to think of. When we did talk to the users, though, they really trust vaccines, a problem we have in many other settings now. We're getting people turning against vaccines. They trust them, but they were worried about the little baby's arms. And so that was their concern, but they trust vaccines and they really had high, high belief in them. So again, we had to start thinking about those interactions. Hip vaccine's also very expensive. Um, and so bringing it into a poor health system, a poor health budget um, was going to be a challenge too. So we also had to find a way to do it effectively so donors would pay for it on a declining scale over time. So we also thought about those building blocks. Again, it's, um, it's provided at clinics, but they also do outreach. So you had to think about how that was going to happen. How do you get vaccines stored and the syringes and the needles and the disposal of those happening safely everywhere you go? Same way of delivering it. So we didn't need to train people and it wasn't extra work. So that was a useful thing. 
The information system had to add another vaccine in, so we had to think about that. The financing I mentioned, and again, we had to have leadership to actually advocate for that business case because the Ministry of Health just saw this as another cost. So we had to build a business case about the number of deaths that were occurring, the costs of drug-resistant Haemophilus influenza, and balance that by actually trying to put a value, an economic value, to children's lives to try to show that it was worth investing in this. So as we started introducing an innovation, all those aspects needed to be thought about. And again, the effectiveness decay, this vaccine, 85% or more effective against Haemophilus influenza. So it's worth putting into the system. But we had to think again around all of those aspects to ensure that you got that effectiveness. The last example, and I've already worked through this a little bit, is around malaria. So as you know, um, our friends in China knew for a long time that artemisinin was useful against fevers. Uh, it was then rediscovered with our Chinese colleague um, who actually got the Nobel Prize for that and some Americans to actually use artemisinin, so artemisinin combination therapy. And that's, that's our standard now for malaria treatment. But it's a lot more expensive, multiple, multiple times more expensive than chloroquine, which most of all of us in the room, some of us in the room are old enough to have taken it as well. Um, but because of that, they wanted a good diagnosis. So we got rapid diagnostic tests. So now you're bringing two innovations, a test and a drug at the same time, and they both needed to be done. So a slightly more complicated innovation to bring in. But also access has been a problem, and a lot of people will go to local drug stores, down to the markets. I've even found um, IT stores in parts of the Pacific that sell malaria drugs, just because they can. <clears throat> so you have to think about those sorts of things. Also, this artemisinin drug, <clears throat> you have to take it for three days, morning and night. But after the first dose, you get a lot of clearance of the parasites. You feel really great after one dose. That's good for the person, bad for adherence, because you still want them to take five more doses. So we had that problem with this one as well. How do you actually get them to, to support adherence? So they were things we had to think about to, make, to keep the effectiveness of this new drug, because we had to because we've got drug resistance to all of the others. Now we also have drug resistance to the artemisinin combination coming from Cambodia, Thailand, Vietnam, parts of Myanmar. Uh, so it's, it's happening again with this drug. We need to stop that happening. So we needed to think about all of those things again. And I, I won't pull it out. I think you can see now how those examples work. Needed to think about those building blocks and again, I'd already worked through the malaria uh, example when I was showing you about those steps to effectiveness. So they're ones that I've used it in. So now I'm going to stretch myself and think about the innovations for healthy ageing. Because there's a lot of people, including here, a lot of the leaders are here in, in uh, Singapore, found lots of articles about innovation in this space. So can we use, should we use, some of these frameworks to, to get the most out of those innovations for the client, for the older person? So that's what I thought I'd try to do with you tonight. And there you can see some of them. These are some of the, we'll go through these. This is sensor patch with, for, um, for uh, diabetes control. This might be the, the platform that people have in there, so your, your phones. Uh, might be the things that help you monitor all of those things. Um, this here is some physiotherapy for rehabilitation. So I'm sitting at home, but I've also got the physio at the other end working with me to make sure I'm doing them properly. And I had to put a robot in there, but I didn't want to use the usual little white robot that you always see. So that's a robotic arm helping somebody take their medications. But there's lots of innovations in this space. Are they actually going to make things better? Depends how we introduce them. So Singapore, as is a lot of the world, um, has got a rapid growth of the aged population. Unfortunately, as we get a bit older, none of us in the room are having this problem at the moment, we get chronic diseases. 
hypertension, blood pressure, maybe a touch of diabetes, um, some gout. We get a few problems come along the way. We've used our, our body well and it starts to, um, starts to have a little bit of a protest about that. It's estimated that about 85% of Singaporeans in that older age group have at least one chronic disease. And chronic diseases, they're called chronic, not only because they stay with you till death do you part, but also they need treatment for a long period of time. They chronically need treatment. That's expensive if they always have to come for their prescriptions, if they have to come to a hospital, get specialists to do it. Singapore, Australia, every other high income country is worried that they cannot afford that model of care. And innovation around some of these technologies has been seen as a way maybe we can do something about that. Still provide the right quality of care, but at the home or by remote control somehow. The wearables market, so who here has got a Fitbit or something on? Okay, so a few of us. I'm, I'm, no, no, I don't, so don't worry, but I am wired up at the moment. But the wearables and smart technology market in 2018, they've estimated that it'll be an $18 billion industry by 2021. So lots of innovation in this space. It also means a lot of people are going to be pushing these technologies and why we have to actually think about a systems approach to their introduction. In Singapore, the Healthcare and Biomedical Sciences Subcommittee of um, the Infocom Development Authority of Singapore made these statements, oh, sorry, not that one, made these statements, that's their report and um, I'll give you, there are references available if people want things. But basically they talked about the aging population, they talked about those chronic diseases, and also, as we're getting older, we're expecting more out of our health system as well, particularly some of us who are the baby boomers. Um, the system of healthcare was said by this report that in Singapore it was fragmented and uncoordinated, healthcare services, I'm using their words, and that these rapid advances are there, but they could be brought in ineffectively. So I thought that was an important um, platform to think about this topic here in Singapore. We also get excited when we see some of these sorts of results. So this was, um, this was a, ra a trial in uh, six locations in Australia, five states, six locations, some urban, some rural. Um, and they actually looked at home monitoring of chronic diseases for aged care. And what excites people are some of the numbers you see there because this was very effective. They did it for a couple of years, but that's a problem with most of the studies so far as I've reviewed them. None of them were more than a year or two years old. So we are getting excited without a long track record yet, something to, to think about. 43% reduction, 46% uh, reduction in medical benefits expenditure. That makes our Minister of Health very happy. 25% reduction in pharmaceutical expenditures, again, a good thing. Reduction in hospital admissions, and that's very important in Australia. A hospital bed in Australia costs per day, um, you know, two, three thousand dollars a day. So if you can keep them out of hospital, again, save some of the ka-ching, ka-ching that the health system has to pay for. 40% reduction in mortality. That was a bit unexpected. The money we thought, but the mortality that's an important thing if we think about the patient. They probably want to survive. They had high rates of user acceptability about these technologies. So it was different sensors, monitors, and some telehealth things. So they could actually talk to a provider from their home. And 89% of the clinicians recommended this to others, would say they, they would recommend it. So they thought they could save at least um, you know, quite a large investment. The return on investment, which economists like, was between 4.9 and 6. For every dollar spent, you got $6 back in savings. That excites us. That's why health systems around the world are looking at these innovations, particularly for older people and for chronic diseases. But that's the theoretical effectiveness. How do we make sure we keep that as we go through a health system? 
And these, these are just some flashes. These are what I've found in Singapore over the last sort of six months, 2017, 2018. It's a hot topic in magazines, on Channel News Asia, telehealth, there it is again this year. Worldwide healthcare wearables, I've told you that number, but that was um, here in Singapore. And physiotherapy exercises, and I showed you that picture around that. So it's a hot topic here. And the use of remote technologies. This is sort of, uh, again, what it's, it could look like. Now, only two of us, three of us in the room had a, a, a wearable. So, you know, we've got a big push to try to get a bigger acceptance of even having wearables to get this happening. Um, but basically, there we are, there's the um, elderly. They didn't find an elderly woman to add there as well. Um, maybe we don't grow old, so that's why they had a problem with that. We stay young forever. Um, so you, you've got different technologies that can look at body temperature, heart rate, respiration rate, blood pressure, oxygen, the oxygen in your blood, so pulse oxygenation, blood glucose, vital signs. And these can be done either by sensors that are on the skin, Sometimes maybe home monitoring with blood pricks, but again, trying, there's a lot of people trying to get rid of that in the technologies. It then has to somehow get from that person and whatever they've got connected to them, like me, to somewhere. <coughs> Either to them so that they can modify their behaviour or to their practising clinician, healthcare team, general practitioner, whatever the model of care is. So that word model of care. And as I go through this literature, model of care is often not talked about. The technologies are. Or the user technology interface is, but not how is this going to fit into our existing models of care? Or do we need new models of care? So problem number one that I've seen and sort of going through this with my systems approach. So somehow it's got to um, get to, through something into first aid centres, medical centres, ambulances, and sometimes this is also part of a research program. You also have sensors that can look at, because some of us, as we get a little bit older, we aren't as steady on our feet, we might fall, uh, we might get out of bed, fall out of bed, we might have a little accident if we go to the bathroom, we forget to turn the gas off when we cook something. So you can have all of those things monitored. There's motion monitors, door monitors, spill monitors, electricity, gas monitors. Your whole house, if you're an old person, could end up measuring everything you do. Just a little interesting one that I heard. Um, they had a monitor that was measuring people getting out of bed and they'd estimated how long it should take and a little alarm goes. They'd forgotten that sometimes older people take a little bit longer to get out of bed. So this thing was ringing for far too long. It lost, it lost its acceptability pretty quickly because I'm getting out of bed and it just kept ringing and ringing and ringing. You also need someone at the other end to respond. And I have heard in Canada where they've had these sorts of monitors for people with um, respiratory conditions, chronic respiratory conditions, and they actually showed uh, a chart which showed that this person at home had one very acute episode that probably required hospitalisation, but nobody was watching the monitor back in the health centre. They recovered that time. A week later, they had another acute exacerbation. Should have, something should have happened. Nothing did, but they did recover. The third time, somebody was looking at the screen. Saw it, got the ambulance, got them into hospital, but it was too late, and unfortunately, that person passed away. So these are tools, but they still need systems. They still need somebody at the other end who's going to respond. You still need people who are going to take these things seriously. You need the users to be happy with those technologies. Again, some of the wearables, they're finding that older people forget to put them on in the morning. And so that's not going to be very useful if that's part of your care package. So you can have... Uh, Sensors, as I mentioned, all of those sorts of sensors. You can have medication management technology to make sure people are taking their medicines. Although I did read um, 
just recently there's been a glitch with one of those and people were getting the wrong doses instead of two mils a day, uh, three times a day, it said two bottles a day, three times a day. But as that article said, you still need humans in the system. So when people were dispensing it, hopefully they read the label and realized that something had gone wrong with the computer system. So you have to think about some of those things. You also have to think about people's behavior and how they're going to, to work with these technologies, how they're going to accept them. Just another way of thinking about some of this as well, because there's also a lot of other aspects of smart homes. Um, and also you need to think about um, the emergency care providers. How, if there is a problem, are they actually going to get, the service, get to the service that they need to get to? And how are those people wired into the system as well? So the health system is more complex um, than just a health centre or a provider and, and the client. And of course, older people, hopefully, have other family members caring for them. So do these technologies also go to the carer's place first? And what do they do about it? And what's the older pe person feel about their kids keeping an eye on them all the time? So some of those user perspectives are very important. And you don't want intrusive technologies. You don't want in every corner of your house a CCTV. <laughs> you don't want that, them on all the time. So you have to think about those aspects from an older person's perspective, probably even from a younger person's perspective. I'm sure none of you would want every time you move around the house that it's being monitored by somebody else, including perhaps on camera. So you could end up, and this is, this is from Philips, this is showing somebody having their blood pressure taken by the machine, and it's, it's got an interface with an iPad and, and being sent somewhere. Here's somebody who's got um, their sleep being monitored. I don't know, I wouldn't be able to keep that on my head for that long, but some people must be more tolerant. But you might also, some of these things can have multiple purposes, sorry. Um, so they could also link to home security. They can also link to environmental monitoring. So when it's a hot day for older people, make sure that the, it's not too, too hot within the house. A lot of older people dying in heat waves. Um, can detect your activity, including if you've fallen over. So for me, probably it'd be saying you've been too, taking too long to move a distance, so that might trigger somebody to try to phone, to check that I'm okay, that I haven't fallen. If I answer the phone, then nothing's done. If I don't answer the phone, then they might put a camera on to check, has Maxine fallen on the floor, or is she somehow she got into another room and we didn't detect it. So you have those sorts of smart systems happening. If it is that I've fallen, then it would trigger somebody to get some care for me. Wearable sensors, and that's including clothing. So with nanotechnology, this shirt of mine might be measuring a whole series of my vital signs while I'm here. Measuring my body temperature, because I'm getting a bit excited. Um, so it's probably saying, oh, she's getting a bit hot at the moment. My blood pressure's probably okay, it's usually okay. Heart rate's probably up a little bit, and that information would be going somewhere from my clothing. Um, what's the platform? And there's a lot of discussions about what platforms can be used. Are they iPads? Can they be the set-top box of a television? So particularly for older people at the moment, trying to have something that's familiar with the, for them, so they don't have to learn yet another technology. Uh, and then also thinking about um, any automation that's happening with that. So now we come to my magic triangle. How might that all fit in? And interestingly, as I've done the literature review, although there's often trying to look at will people accept this, their longer term experience with it is often not looked at. A few qualitative studies that have actually asked people what have they felt about having this. And a lot of older people have said, well, if it's going to keep me at home longer and let people let me be independent, Oh, that's great. I like that. It's going to keep my kids happy and they're not going to be on my case to go to a nursing home or something. Then, OK, that's, that's good too. But some of them were worried about their loss of power and control. I know my mother, who's on a scheme, she's got some diabetes. She doesn't want every time she goes to be told that she really shouldn't be having that little snack at tea time. You know, sometimes you want to have a bit of a life as well. And so you lose some of your, although you stay in your home, you may not be independent. 
And that's something that some of the articles have talked about. Is it doing something useful for me as a user? What, what am I getting out of being part, using all of this technology? Some people found it stigmatizing. It means I'm old. They don't think I can look after myself anymore. And so now they're wiring me up and checking everything I do. Now, that's not everybody, but they were some of the things that people found when they asked about this. With the technology, I mean, you saw that smart house. How many gadgets can you have? I'm sure some of you in this room have got quite a few gadgets. I know my nephew's got you know, one of those Google things, and as he's driving home, he can turn all the lights on on his phone, and the door opens when he comes, and you know, he's got all of those sorts of things. So what's the mix of technologies people have in their home? Are they actually going to be useful? Many of these gadgets have only had um, small sample sizes, a small period of time of looking at them, uh, have only been done in one sort of population, and very few have been in randomized control trials. A good randomized control trial I found was here in, um, uh, in Singapore that was done at the National University of Singapore uh, by Professor Lien and others about a virtual rehabilitation ward that was trying to prevent people coming prematurely back for readmission when they'd been discharged for cardiac events. And they actually got very good results, but it was a proper randomised control trial. And so you could look at that and say, okay, that probably would work for those sorts of situations. Are they easy to install? And are they easy to maintain? What's the you know, how much intervention has to happen to keep this technology working for me? Uh, and what's going to happen? What's the referral process if they find some information? So there's some of the things I thought you needed to think about, about access. So also, who's going to pay for these? Can everybody afford them? Is it going to be equitable? How are you going to get the coverage you need? Are people going to adhere? I've already talked about people taking the wearables off. You can put something over the cameras. Many of us might have done that in the past. Um, and do you actually, do you feel empowered by using some of these technologies or do you feel that you've lost control? If you move into the health system building blocks, I try to just think about some of the things that I'm finding are missing in the literature at the moment. And things I think all of us, Australia and Singapore, are all looking at these technologies for older person uh, care. What is the model of care? And how are the referral processes going to work? This can't be run by a tertiary service and specialised services. And a lot of this is prevention, either preventing initial stuff or preventing secondary problems like falls and broken hips or diabetes that's no longer controlled by diet but needs to go on to oral treatment or even on to insulin therapy. So you need to think about that model of care. Is the present model of care in Australia or Singapore the right one to introduce these sorts of technologies to get the cost savings that we're talking about? How do you train the workforce? Uh, this is a very different way of thinking about a GP or a healthcare professional working with their clients. So we may have to do a lot of retraining and hopefully our medical schools, our nursing schools, our therapy schools are already thinking about this and getting them ready rather than waiting till they get out and we have to try to get them to think about these sorts of things. And you are going to have to work as teams, interdisciplinary teams and not only within the health sector, but maybe social services, housing, transport, are all going to have to be seen as valued members of the team for these technologies to actually get the effectiveness that we want. Uh, the information is going to have to be shared by a lot of people and available in lots of places. So electronic health records can help that, but that's in the health sector. How can other people get access to it? What's the legal implications of that occurring? The financing. And this is one that uh, Canada said was something that, that took a lot of thinking. Because you can't pay the same amount if a person's not coming and using 30 minutes of a, of a clinician's time, so that it's being done in some other way, but it still has a cost. But also the clinician's going to want to lose those patients and that income. 
So you have to think about how you're going to finance a health system if you're going to use some more of these technologies to try to help you reduce the costs. So it's going to take a lot of thinking about the health financing models for this. And not many countries have actually cracked that yet. There's not that much written about it, but I think it's a major issue to, to consider. And then the regulatory framework, and as one article talked about, also the medical legal status. Using some of these, you might be prescribing medications without actually physically seeing a patient. What does the law say about that? And what's the law going to say if there's a mishap? And who's going to be liable? So there's those sorts of leadership governance issues that need to be thought through. This is what the Royal Australian College of General Practitioners have as a little bit of a guideline for GPs in Australia who may be thinking of using telehealth. But I thought there's a couple of good examples of things to think about there. One, you know, do you have the staff resources to actually keep responding to those monitoring devices? You don't want that man with his respiratory arrest, you don't want that happening every day. Can you meet the cost of setting this up? Because you're going to have to change maybe the configuration of, of your systems, definitely of your computer systems. Is it actually going to, I like question three, will this remote monitoring benefit the health of your patients? Is it going to give benefits to the patient or is it just going to make your life easier or their family's life easier? Putting the patient at the centre. Um, and there's other questions there that I think you know, some of these are the things that we need to have some of these checklists before we just run and start buying into all of these wearables and remotes and sensors and cameras. We have to actually start explicitly asking some of these questions. And then you've got the effectiveness decay. And again, you're now experts on this, but you could already see different places where if we don't do some of these things well, those promises that Australia found in their trial of reduction in morbidity, mortality, pharmaceutical benefits, hospital emissions are not going to be at that level if we don't think about access, provider compliance, patient adherence. And those all need us to think about the people in the system and how they're responding to these things. So in wrapping up, we have to remember that innovations are just tools, they're not the system. You have to look at the system and how the tools are going to work in that system, how the system may have to change. And it's a bit like that early law of physics that many of us learnt. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. This is a health system. And the health system is in government systems and in social systems. So you make some changes, there are going to be effects in other parts of the health system or the social systems. And you have to try to think about those, do some of that scenario thinking, maybe even do some social science to understand how that might occur so you try to minimise. You won't eliminate, but minimise some of those things, those unanticipated consequences. We need to make sure these technologies are acceptable, affordable, available, accessible. Otherwise, they're not going to work. And we need to remember that human beings, we're not, we all have different behaviours. All of you are sitting in different positions, responding to me differently, responding to the technology you may have on your, your lap differently. Uh, you have physiological different responses by being in this room. And you behave differently about dietary advice, or about getting feedback about a health problem you might have. So these technologies are tools, but they're still a human that these technologies are there to help. And we have to understand the person in the center and the family and the community structures around them. So to keep this lovely setting and to have an efficient, effective health system where health technologies can actually help healthy aging, we need to take a systems approach and we need to carefully try to think about how these technologies are going to fit in to the systems we have or the systems we have to have to get maximum, optimise the effectiveness of these great interventions. Thank you very much.